The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I think we're all ready to find out what the secret to email success is. Before we get started, just a reminder to type in your questions um, to the chat box on the right of your screen, and I will read them as they come in. Our presenter encourages questions throughout the presentation instead of saving them for the end, so please don't be shy, and as your questions come in, um, I will uh, get to them. Karen Purvis is a sought-after international speaker known for her energetic, inspiring, and dynamic programs. Karen has been among the highest rated speakers at events on numerous occasions. It's Karen's intention today that you'll see and feel she genuinely cares about your success. Karen's goals are threefold, um, to present useful material in, in an engaging way and to offer tools guaranteed to implement in, immediately. Karen's speaking engagements have taken her to Thailand, Iceland, Italy, Australia, Canada, and throughout the U.S. She earned her bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in public policy. She studied um, improv comedy and performed on main stage at Second City and is a three-time game show winner. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Karen and we'll get started. Thank you so much for that introduction, Katie, and I'm excited and delighted to be here. So I am ready to jump right into this program and offering some immediately applicable email tips that people can use right away. So letting people know that this program is about effective communication in emails, and instead of me discussing whether or not they're effective, this is an example of an email of someone that uh, participated in the program, and the following week, as you see here, within one hour, I had a response and closed job for $3,000. So this was someone's personal experience. And we have another person here who had difficulty reaching someone. If you're reading from the bottom of the, of the screen up, um, someone had talked about, we're interested in getting your feedback. The next person is talking about, we will certainly reach out to you. And then the person was so excited it worked. This was my third attempt at re reaching this person, and the person responded within 12 minutes. So really, some uh, instead of, again, me telling you these things work, it's other people who have participated and found that the ideas that I'm talking about can really be successful for you. What are we covering today? So we're covering subject lines of individual emails and text or content of the emails. Secondly, we're studying how to get someone to open, read, and reply to your email. You'll hear me say that a number of times, open, read, and reply. And finally, identifying the key buzzwords to grab the receiver's attention. And this is going to be true whether you are in finance, IT, HR, sales, across the board. So it's my understanding we have people here who are in uh, sales of the vehicle parts, um, people who are in the entire supply chain process, sales to vendors catalog, as I mentioned, some HR. So I'm understanding that there is um, some, what shall I say, um, commonality among perhaps half of you that you're involved in the sales process to some extent, but perhaps for half of you or so that that not, is not the case and we'll be um, talking about examples in, in either case. So what's important to me, and I'm, I'm actually going to take a, a pause here and we'll see if people are able to type in quickly, the examples of the most common types or topics of emails that you send, and I'll actually tack onto this, that you are not getting the responses you would like to get. So for some people, this is uh, a cold lead. For some people, this is upselling a current client. For some people, this may be, I'm just trying to set up a meeting, and I'm emailing three people, and nobody's getting back to me. Or for some people, this may be, I'm trying to get a document back from another department, and the person is just not responding. 
but I'll actually give a moment to see if you can, this will help make the program much more helpful for you. Um, and as you heard in the introduction, Katie mentioned that I have uh, studied improv, so I'd much rather make a program that's customized to you and the types of examples of emails that you're sending that you're not getting the responses that you'd like as opposed to me guessing what those would be. So um, for those of you who have quick thoughts on this, like uh, emails to set up meetings, emails to get feedback, sales, if you just want to type in some quick comments, what are the types of emails you send, and again, I'm, I'm tacking onto that, that you are not getting the responses that you like. Katie, as I'm saying that, is, um, are you receiving any feedback? Give me one second to read this. Um, sure. Okay, the one person says, I try to reach out to original manufacturers to see if they would be interested in partaking in our sampling program. Oftentimes they express interest and reach out first, but then do not follow through after I reach out to them. Um, okay. Go ahead, person, yes, thank you. Yeah, selling additional product lines to current customers. And then the third one, information requests, document requests, and decision requests from other departments within the same company. Oh, okay. So information requests, product requests, and what was the third one? Decision making, de decision make makers. Okay, decision great. Okay, so um, original manufacturer samples say yes and then don't follow through. Selling additional product lines to current clients and trying to get information, product information or decision makers with current clients. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. Okay, great. Those will be perfect examples for me. If more come in, feel free to interrupt me, but I'll go ahead and use those. So thank you to those of you who sent in those comments. Great. So I'm going to jump right in. I have a number of uh, tips that we're going to go through, and you'll notice my numbering system is completely wacky. So if you're, num if you're noticing I skip from 1 to 7, or I have a 10 and a half, or I have all sorts of crazy numbering system in there. So if you'll bear with me that the numbering system is, is just not going to make sense to you because it's actually a three-hour program we're doing in an hour. Um, and then I added some things for you specifically customized. So if you'll just bear with me on that, I, I appreciate it. Um, so number one, in the subject line of your emails, and again, this is going to be true for, for anyone in any of the departments or you know anyone throughout this organization who's on the line, put the person's name followed by a hyphen and a short subject. For example, and this is exactly what I'm saying here, it might seem really, really precise, but um, we, I have studied over 10,000 emails and um, across industries, actually including the automotive industry, and gotten feedback on what works and what doesn't for increased income, increased contract signing, increased responses to emails. And some of these things might seem absolutely um, inane to you, but we've tested everything and I'm providing the best information and the most up-to-date information that I could provide for you. So when I say Tom, I mean Tom, I don't mean Mr. Smith. Um, and when there's a space before the hyphen and then a space, I actually do mean space hyphen space and I don't mean semicolon. And then you're going to have your subject line and I encourage a subject line to be as short as possible and with a small letter in the first letter of that word. So for example, update is going to have a small u, not a capital U. And a question mark. We would not have the quotes. Um, I'm just showing you the quotes here as an example. So here's an example you see in the subject line, Regina space hyphen space small s speaker updates question mark. Okay, um, number three, again, we're skipping two, everything's fine, we don't have to worry about number two right now. Um, use a question mark whenever possible in the subject line. For example, Tom hyphen, 
excuse me, Tom Space, hyphen space, meeting, again with a small m, and then a question mark. Question marks are literally, in email, our most powerful tour, to, excuse me, tool for inducing guilt in someone. So we've, they can't see our face, they can't see our tone of voice, um, they're not, you know, getting a message, we're not sitting over lunch. So in order to get someone to open, read and reply, reply, we really want that question mark to induce them to action. So this would be an example, Mike, space, hyphen, space, updates. And again, this is going to be true for those of you particularly who are having trouble with the follow through when you're talking about um, the original manufacturer saying, yes, we're interested in more samples, but then not following through. And also in the last example that someone typed in looking for help, getting information um, from people about products, getting information from decision makers, this question mark is one of the most powerful tools that you have. Number four, when you are in the text of an email and asking two or more questions, you want to pull them out of the text. So instead of saying essentially, are we meeting on Wednesday, and then keep going on the line, and are we meeting at 10 o'clock, you're giving an opportunity to, for someone to just say yes, and you don't know if they're saying yes to the Wednesday, or they're saying yes to the 10 a.m., and then you have to send another email, and then they send one back. It's a whole silly thing. So um, this is an example, again, where I have a, a number of questions, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you might think, wow, that's a really annoying email to get. And while it might not be the um, optimal email to get, instead of going back and forth in 37 emails to cover six points, it's much better to receive them in one email. Katie, just want to touch base to see if any other uh, comments or questions are coming in? Uh, no, go ahead. Perfect. Okay. Um, and along the question mark point, I would also say to put a question mark at the end of a paragraph if it makes sense. And this is an example. Um, I'll, I'll talk about here when people go into a store, people go into a warehouse, or people go into a department store, people go in anywhere, Target, Walmart, there's a normal way in the United States, there's actually a normal way people do it in Australia and the United Kingdom. Um, when people come in a door, most people in the United States will turn to a certain direction. They'll either turn to the left or the right. And if I were in person with you right now, I'd ask you in person. But since I'm not, um, the, the answer is, is that most people in the United States will turn to the right when entering a store. That's been studied by cameras, et cetera, et cetera. So there's something similar that's been studied in emails as far as eye tracking, where a person's eyes go and what makes that person more likely to respond to your email. Where a person's eyes go are at the end of the subject line, the greeting, and the end of the first paragraph. And so these are the uh, sticking points or the points where we really want to grab people, end of the subject line, greeting, end of the first paragraph. So again, when we want to um, end our paragraph with a question mark, again, relying on that internal sense of inducing guilt to say, oh, this is something I have to get back to them on, this is something I have to answer, um, as opposed to just going into the deal with it later and then later never comes. Okay, so this is an example of something, and for those of you who were uh, journalism majors or English majors, you know this is grammatically incorrect, um, but I invite you to consider this. For example, this slide is about talking. So we've got a slide that says, I wanted to touch base for your religious schedule, a time to talk. What are good times and days for you in the next few weeks? Later in the day, it tends to be better or me. So we have an email about talking. So we learn that in communication, in a paragraph, all items in a paragraph are about the same topic. So here, um, theoretically, this final line should be up in the previous 
uh, paragraph if we wanted to be grammatically correct. But the fact is, if we're grammatically correct, we're less likely to get a response. We're more likely to have to go back and forth. Um, and that person, again, is, is more likely to just um, not follow through on a reply to you. So I invite you to consider doing something grammatically incorrect so that the first paragraph ends in a question mark and then you have a line beneath. And a couple of people asked me about some specifics in this slide. And actually I will say, Katie, are you or other people able to see my cursor as I'm moving it around or no? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, right here, this is just completely a mistake. You're seeing that this is indented a little bit. This is just a problem with my uh, computer programs. I just want you to know any emails, I do encourage you to be flush left. So there's nothing weird about this indentation other than the fact that my computer program uh, had a problem with this PowerPoint slide. And also, of course, this red arrow is just to point out this point to you in the slide. I don't recommend you have a red arrow in your slide. Um, but just to be, people have asked me that in person as I'm going through the slide and just want to offer that. Okay? So this goes along with the question mark step of instead of making a statement like, I look forward to our next step or I look forward to hearing from you, um, we want to turn those into a question. For example, what do you suggest as a next step? So here you say, can you kindly suggest a next step for and again, for those of you who are talking about samples with the manufacturer for getting together to discuss the new samples. Or can you kindly suggest the best next step um, for uh, good times to set up a meeting with you? So instead of saying, I look forward to hearing back from you, you turn that into a question. This is, this is actually very important. So if anyone has a question on this, uh, go ahead and please type into Katie. Katie, any other thoughts or feedback coming in yet? Yeah, so two questions going back to the subject line. Um, how Good. many words are too many in a subject line? And related to that, besides updates, what other subject line keywords will get the receiver's attention? Okay, perfect. Um, the second question we'll be going into much more detail on, so I will be covering that as we go on. Um, but I, I can't say something about that now. Um, the bottom line in a subject line, a, yeah, subject line, is try your best to summarize in one word or the fewest amount of words possible. What's the point? If this, like, imagine this was name that tune, like, I can name that tune in seven notes, I can name that tune in five notes, I can name that tune in one note. Like, the word doing this, this whole point in your email that you're sending to this person is, buy my stuff. Or the whole point of this email is, we, I need your help. Like, please answer this question. In order for me to move forward, I need the answer to this question, you know, when can you meet? Do you want to buy more? Um, when can we get together? Um, so I encourage you to think about what's the point, and the point might be contract. The point might be meeting. The point might be update. The, the point might be, um, you know, so trying and, and squeezing and squeezing down as few as, as possible as you can. But, but you're trying to summarize the, whether your email is 10 pages long or one sentence long. You're trying to summarize that email in ideally as few words as possible and even one word. So that's kind of answering the second question first, but we will be going into other specifics. Um, the second question is uh, really as few as possible. Um, the, a key question, uh, uh, generally speaking, questions that will get better answers in the text of an email 
or in person or over the phone are seven word or less questions. So that's just something I want to invite you to keep in mind, whether you're talking to someone in person, like when you say, da 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 and then you have this whole long part, like you lose people. Like, you know, it gets to be like Charlie Brown's t-shirts, wah, 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 you know, like tune out. So generally speaking, seven words or less is a good rule to go by. However, seven words in um, in the subject line is still too many. Um, so I don't have an, a specific number for you, but for example, this slide, um, it also depends on how long the words are. So, you know, like Got Milk is going to be different than Annual Leadership Conference where you're seeing more letters. So uh, I, I don't have a specific number for you other than I know seven is too many, five is pushing it, um, and what was I going to say? I was going to say, oh, if you are saying, for example, um, the, like, we're having a party for the Super Bowl, let's just say that's your subject line, like, hey, friends, um, we're having a party for the Super Bowl, you want to put the most important part first. So you want to say Super Bowl party. You don't want to say we're having a party for the Super Bowl. Um, you want to say Super Bowl party um, as the first part. And you could also, there's another reason for this is texting. That when you send an email and a text, a lot of times the rest of the subject line is cut off. So you want to try and have it be, again, as few as possible. And again, the point is to open, uh, open read and reply. And the first step to having it open is to um, have it as short as possible. So again, I, I don't have a statistical number for the subject line. I do have that number of seven. Um, as far as ideally, but again, you'll see um, in this sample and many other samples, I'll, I'll have sentences that are much more than than seven words. So that's a general rule. Karen, Is that how? Good. Good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's helpful. One other question that came in, um, as far as sending um, email, so like, is it better, or what is your research on sending an email from like a name, so Katie, McQuiston at autocare.org versus info at autocareer.org. I have not studied that, but generally speaking, what I know about researching this for seven or eight years and um, is it doesn't matter much. Uh, it matters a slight amount, but it doesn't matter much. But I, I haven't studied that specific uh, question. So rarely I'll get a point, um, and again, that's more with cold sales than it is with a current client or, you know, just trying to um, sell additional products or, or get someone to get a response from a decision maker. Um, they're not taking the time to even look. You know, if somebody has a current relationship with you that's, and they're busy, that's the, that's the last thing they're worried about. 99 people out of 100 at least are not worried about that. Um, but but there, there, is, there is a small percentage of people who, who are. Is that helpful, Katie, do you think? Yes, and one other question just came in. Is it tacky to send email from a cell phone? Most cell phones have a tagline underneath that say, sent from an yeah. iPhone or sent from an Android. Oh, so what's the question? Is it tacky or seen as, and what, what, I guess, what is the perception of that? What is the perception of sending, sending an email from your phone? With the tagline sent from an iPhone 6. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't technically know the answer to that question, but I, I do know that people prefer something to nothing. So if you, someone has asked you a question and they're just like, you know, what's the price of the such and such, or you're wanting to know, you know, when can you get that follow-up brochure to me, or when can we meet, people want to know the answer to the question. So if you follow up and if you say, I'm on the run, you know, I can get back to you by 10, or if you say, on the road, you know, whatever it is, people, people want to know, want to hear from you. So um, even, even if the answer is you don't know, people want to know that you don't know. 
And even if, even if the answer is we thought we'd have the answer by now and we don't have the answer by now, people want to know. And again, um, Katie talked to me about their perhaps being more men on this call than women. And men historically, this isn't, this isn't a, a dig or whatever with men, but just technically speaking, when men are asked a question that they don't know the answer to in an email, they typically will not reply until they have that answer, whereas women will typically, if someone asks them a question in an email, they'll typically respond and say, oh yeah, you know, thanks for the question, I'm not in a place to answer that question, I'll answer it when I get back to you. And the guy's kind of like, why am I wasting my time telling you I don't have an answer, I don't have an answer, I'll get back to you when I do. And the problem with that particular technique is, people want to hear from you. So I would say an answer in an email with, I do know, an answer in an email that says, you know, this is sent from my iPhone 6 or whatever that's at the bottom of it. If you're answering someone's question, they would rather hear from you than not hear from you. Good questions. I appreciate them, you coming in with them. That's great. And anything else coming in, Katie? Uh, no, I think we can go ahead and move forward. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so this is one, um, this can be to a current client, um, but this is uh, for those of you in sales, this can also be true. If someone has not responded to two emails you have sent, and I emphasize that this is the third email you sent, not the first, not the second, um, but the third, and this is a phrase I've tested over and over and over again. This is probably the most tested phrase there is. Is you want to put the person's name and then space hyphen space small r request the courtesy of a reply. Request the courtesy of a reply. So this is a really powerful tool. If you're not getting responses from people, again, please do not use this the first time. Please do not do this the second time. But if you use it the third time, you will get about eight to nine out of every ten people that you are sending an email to. And they'll respond in some way. You know, they'll say, oh, I've been getting them, things have been busy, or oh, we're not thinking about this till first quarter next year, and people don't perceive this as rude. People perceive this as um, very uh, appropriate uh, way of doing business. So request the courtesy of a reply is a strong um, and powerful tool that you can have um, to someone who's quote unquote blowing you off or ignoring you. Okay? Um, if someone does reply to their meet to your email, match their greeting. So if they say, hi, Karen, you want to say, hi, Jim, or if they say, Karen Colon, you want to use Jim Colon. So for example, here, I started off by saying Lawrence, comma, which is the way that I do recommend you start off an email. When in doubt, start off with the person's first name and um, a comma. He came back with hi Karen comma, so I came back with hi Lawrence comma. So when in doubt, I recommend first name comma, and then when, when so to speak, people show you who they are, believe them and go ahead and use that. Okay, and so this person, you know, she's coming with hi, comma, Karen Purvis, exclamation point. And again, I think this is annoying, but it doesn't matter if I think this is annoying. I wrote her back and I said hi, comma, you know, Sarah Smith, exclamation point, or whatever her name was, um, to make her really feel understood and heard. So uh, matching people's um, matching people's greeting. So. Uh, when you are saying something negative in an email, for example, you know, um, well, I have examples here. Do not use the word you. Excuse me. So example here, you didn't make the cut. Um, that doesn't feel good as, um, you know, we've decided to go with another um, organization. So if you have something negative to say to a company, um, or to a person, really try to stick with I messages as much as possible instead of you messages. Okay, um, a, if you're kind of falling asleep, I know it's 12:30. We're halfway through here. If you're typing some other emails, if you're checking out, I invite you to check back in for this slide right here. This is uh, one of the most powerful tools that I can give you in um, email correspondence, and that is the word help. 
So going back to the question about what are other examples of words you can use in the subject line besides update, um, help almost always is going to be an appropriate response. This can be used to people in your organization, outside your organization, people you know, people you don't know, first contacts, 127th contacts, it doesn't matter. Um, small h and um, space, hyphen space, and um, it's so powerful, this word. And oftentimes it could just be like, you summarize your whole email is, I need your help. You know, I need your help to sell you something. I need your help to know whether or not you want brochures. I need your help to know whether you want additional products. I need your help in getting an answer from the decision maker on whether you can come forward. All those examples you gave to me in the beginning, these can all be true. So um, when in doubt, if you don't know what to say, think if help would make sense and go ahead and um, use that. So for those of you in particular who are in sales, these two closings have been tested, best or best wishes. And as far as op not only open, read, and reply to your email, but contracts signed, as far as money coming into companies after 365 days of using these email practices, the companies that receive the highest amount of income with those that closed with best or best wishes. So for me, I don't, I don't like these closings. These closings are very unnatural for me. But when I'm in a sales situation, I will use best or best wishes because I know that they work. Once I have a relationship with someone, I don't use these closings because they don't, they're, they aren't my style or they aren't natural for me. But I encourage you to consider um, best or best wishes of the closing, particularly I realize not everybody on the line is in sales, but for those of you who are, I want you to know that not just open read and reply, but dollars collected at the end of the year, uh, this single word matters. So I, I really want to uh, emphasize that point. Let me see. So yeah, uh, and watch the phrase, I have no idea. So a lot of times people ask you something and they'll say, oh, what's the price on this? Or, or you'll say, when, when are you available to meet? And you'll say, oh, I have no idea. Well, you probably know it's a dollar or $10,000. You know, or you probably know between now and the 2018 Summer Olympics. You know, like, you, you generally have a sense. So this is an example. I wrote someone a question, approximately how many attendees do you estimate at the session? A hundred? And she writes, I have no idea. I think 100 is a good beginning. Um, now, there's no need for her to type that sentence, I have no idea, because she does have an idea. She has an idea that it's not five, it's not 5,000, so she could simply just answer this question, yes. You know, approximately how many attendees do you ask me in session 100? You just can simply say yes, because I, I did use the phrase approximately. Okay. And this is really important. Um, any questions coming in? Are I talking too fast? Are we doing okay, Katie? Uh, one question that came in yep. um, mm -hmm. for the best best wishes. How yes. do you have any idea of how you would translate that for the Latin American market? No, and that's a good question. Um, there, I actually. Um, it, first of all, yeah, sorry. It's, it's more, the, the, what I've studied is Germanic language com countries, and particularly the United States. There are uh, significant differences in Latin American countries. Um, in, well, there's actually, interestingly, the other people have studied this. So if you want to look up research on this, um, I can follow up with the researcher. There, are, there is there are some, a couple of people in the world who are studying this. Um, in the Asian, um, uh, Eastern Asian countries, there are some similarities. Then there are some similarities between kind of Australia, Canada, and the United States, but there are some things that are unique to United States. United States, but Latin American countries, along with some romantic, quote unquote, romantic um, language countries like uh, France or Spain, 
They have a much different communication style, particularly in email, that is much more verbose, much more um, longer sentences, catching up with people, using um, uh, what do you call it, like surnames, you know, saying Mr. and Dr. And um, there's quite a few differences in the Latin American countries. So I don't know the specific answer to that question other than um, it probably, it, it, you definitely would want to use something like that, but you might want to even use something longer than that, you know, or even more, um, uh, yeah, I mean, more words, if that makes sense. But my, my research in particular has focused on um, people in the United States. So I, I hope okay. that's helpful to a, a certain extent. Great. And then we're getting some additional questions about email signature, but I don't want to jump too far uh, ahead. Oh, OK. And a, a ton, OK, so tell, tell me the questions. That's great. There, there are a lot of similar. So if you can talk about the best, um, best practices as far as setting up your signature, what all you need to include, um, particular, okay. yeah, font, okay. color, style. Oh, OK. Font, font, color, style. We're going to be, let me go backwards here and see if I have one of mine. Here we go. OK. So I'll get into font and color and style in a minute. Um, but as far as um, what we found is name, what, what I'm showing here on this slide, name, oh, excuse me, that's my mistake, sorry, okay, name, company name, address, as if it were on a envelope. So name, company name, address, phone, fax, email, web. And again, for email and web, you don't necessarily have to say that it's email and web because everybody knows what email and web are. But if you want to keep consistency, um, I actually prefer um, P colon, F colon, or C colon. Um, as far as cell phone facts. I personally am a big small letter uh, person, I mean, you, you can tell my company is small letters, so I just use small letters. But, so it's fine if you use capital P, capital C, or capital F, but the shortest, uh, as short as you're comfortable using. So instead of phone, P-H-O-N-E, you would want P-H or just P. Instead of, you know, facsimile, uh, you would want fax or just F. Um, so this is the, the order that I would say. It would be name, company name, address, uh, phone, fax, email, web. And then people have or sell. You know, you could say phone or you could say direct. You know, sometimes people say direct. That's OK, too. Is that? Is that how? Then, sure. Uh, as far as including social media, um, do you know oh, that? I don't know the answer to that. I have not studied that. As far as where to put those little boxes, Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff? Yes. I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's OK. Uh, we can move on. So then one other question came in. How long should I give a customer to reply prior to sending Good. a follow-up? Great. It depends. Um, usually it depends. So if something. Let's see. If something's going to be happening, like you need to know something, you really have to have an answer in 10 days, then I would usually half put it, put it in half or put it in thirds. So if I follow, if I need to, I really need to know something, like today's the whatever it is. I don't know what today is, the 10th. So let's just say I really, really have to know something by Friday, the 13th. I would follow up with them tomorrow late or something. I usually cut it in thirds or half. I mean, if, if you know you don't need to know something for like three months or you're, if for cold leads, that's, I'll just say this for sales. For sales, I recommend one month intervals. So if you're trying to reach someone on 
February 10th, put them in your particular file for March 10th, and then put them in your particular file for April 10th. And that's it. I give people three chances. Um, and then drop it. But for other things where you are trying to get a response, like, you know, who's going to be available for meeting? Are you interested in getting a brochure? And for something that's just completely random, you know, like you've asked someone, um, you know, are you interested in samples? And they say yes. And then you say, well, here's something. And then they don't follow up. You can put some random thing. Like a lot of times, I'll give people seven to ten days. Like it's a reasonable thing to consider that somebody would have responded to your email if it's moderately important uh, within ten days. And you know, and then there's going to be other things where it's like you literally need to know something in 18 hours, and you know, then you're going to follow up in six hours or ten hours or whatever it is. But for cold leads, one month for. Uh, not important things, but somewhat important. I give people seven to ten days um, as a general timeline. I give that you do have a deadline for. I would follow up one third to one half between the time that you're sending it to the to the time that's the deadline. Does that make sense? Am I making sense, Katie? Yeah. Yep. That's great. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, was there another question there? Let me see. I want to make sure. Uh, how well, yeah, okay. Okay, so it's okay. Uh, yeah, this is important. So you'll see that I'm skipping some slides, but it's totally fine. Um, but this is important. Watch out for inadvertently giving commands. We do this all the time. Like we'll just say, please, or something like, please read my email, or open, or attend. Here's some example. Like you say, Jeremy, check out our new website, or let's just, oh, okay. So, you know, anytime you, you're telling, you're using a verb, like open this email, or attend our wine soiree, or um, you're, you're commanding someone to do something. That works awesome. For those of you who are in marketing, that works awesome in other marketing realms, you know, whether it's billboards, whether it's letters, whether it's phone calls, but it does not work in emails. Um, so I really encourage you to focus, instead of what you're telling them to do, focus on what it is they'll receive. So. Um, we don't have a ton of time to go into this, but instead of, you know, like I say, attend our wine soiree, it's a matter of, like, free wine. You know, what are they getting? They're getting free wine. They're getting fun. They're getting to mix elbows. They're getting to, you know, instead of um, order now and receive a 10% discount, say 10% discount until Wednesday. What are they getting? instead of what do they have to do. So um, we'll do that. Okay, or do, do, do. Okay, so font. The font that has pulled the highest amount of response rates and works well between Macs and um, whatchamacallits, uh, Microsoft Word or PCs, is Arial, 10 point, and navy blue. And people think I'm, this is a quiz, you know, which one is correct. All of these are correct. So Arial font, font, 10 point font, and navy blue font. And some people ask about this navy blue. Um, you should have a little box, like when you go into like fonts for your email, where you can pick this. It is just a dark blue. Um, and that's the, the highest response rate is that dark blue. If you don't have that and you're just like, come on, this is ridiculous. All we have is like red, green, that kind of, let me see if I can show it here. Like here, you know, like the electric blue that comes in uh, website address. If you have to pick between this blue and black, if you just have simple program, just a couple of fonts to choose from, pick this, sorry, pick this blue over over the black. Pick blue over black if you only have those two choices. But if you can, um, pick navy blue. Powerful. These are powerful techniques. Um, this is something, I, this is a little aside. I don't know, we've got about uh, 15 more minutes. I sent a batch of emails out. I think it was 27 emails that were follow-ups on warm leads. And I sent them with um, Times New Roman 
black 11 font or something like that, I had zero replies, zero out of 27, sent the same exact emails with the same exact subject line to the same exact 27 people 30 days later, later and I used Arial 10 point navy blue and I had 17 replies. 17 out of 27. So again, this you, you say like, does this really matter? Yes, it really matters. Is it going to get everyone? No, it's not going to get everyone. But we're giving all these little bits and pieces to get as many people as we can. Okay. Uh, let me see. Actually, yeah, I will say this. Okay. Can, can we ask people how much do they talk money in an email? Are there people who want to know about how to negotiate money in an email, or uh, is this not something people are interested in? If people just want to type in, yes, talk about money in an email, yes, talk about money in an email, or people are like, no, we always yeah, talk money in person. A, a resounding yes. All the awesome. Time. Okay, perfect. So if you like to negotiate in person or on the phone, awesome, great keep negotiating in person and on the phone. I'm not saying don't ever negotiate in person, but if you want to add to your arsenal how to, um, excuse me, how to uh, close a deal in an email in the easiest way, this is what I recommend. So say someone's asking you point blank, and here you can see as, as an example, I've contacted this person three times because you can see in the email I have request a favor of reply. It used to be request a favor of reply. Now I found out that we probably didn't know with request of courtesy of a reply. So this is the third time I've contacted these people. She comes back with essentially what do you charge? You know, so say you've contacted a new place and they come back as how much do you charge for such and such. So your answer, you want it to be wrote three points. Okay, so the first point is, it is very important to me that I provide you with at least one option that meets your free structure. Okay, then you want to use the word range, home on the range. Then you want to look at the word ballpark. So this is your three point structure. It's very important to me that I provide you with a quote, you know, that meets your free structure, it meets your budget. What range are you looking to spend? Do you have a ballpark of what you usually spend? Do not just jump from one to three. Do not just use two. It's the three point thing. And I could, you know, we don't have the time to go into it, but the point is, trust me, <laughs> you know, we can certainly talk about this afterwards, but um, this, is the, this is the domino effect that causes people to fall as easily and as quickly as possible. And again, this person was on the East Coast, so you could see here, she wrote me at 307, I wrote her back, this is like, you know, eight minutes later, um, and she wrote me back nine minutes later, this is 624 her time. And so once she gave me a number, I could then say yes. So here's another example. Somebody started again. We'll start at the bottom here. Please let me know your fees. Oh, what do you know? It's very important to me that I provide you at least one option. What range? Ballpark. And you can even tack on this sentence. We're making every effort to negotiate with clients in 2015, you know, whatever. You could say something like that. So again, um, I responded, she responded within an hour and 20 minutes, would you be able to do it for X and I can come back with, you know, four, four minutes later, absolutely, da 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 da. So this one, two, three, um, making them say the number first, and again, you know, you might, your answer might be no, but you could say, you know, let me go to my supervisor, let's see what we can do, but um, this is uh, an amazingly effective um, uh, technique to work that works quickly um, and you'll get to an answer. Uh, it's just beautiful. Again, if, if you love to talk money verbally, great. Um, if you don't like to talk money, um, this is a great uh, backup or a, a, a addition. So this is another thing where people talk about where you're talking about not getting follow through or you just are left hanging. This is a big thing of people not responding. You know, you might say, are you interested in our brochures? Are you blah, 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 and then nothing. So um, one thing you could say if someone does follow up and they're giving you what I call, consider to be the blow off or the brush off, so to speak, is, again, this three point, three point uh, phrase. Would you suggest I follow up at some point to touch base? 
or just wait to hear from you if there's a fit. We end with a question mark. Pulling down to the second line, if you suggest I follow up, kindly let me know a time frame. And this is the kicker, you'll get about 30% more people if you add the space. I'll follow your lead. So I'll actually leave this, this uh, slide up on the screen for a moment. Would you suggest I follow up at some point to touch base? or just wait to hear from you, question mark. Next thing, if you suggest I follow up, kindly let me know a time frame. Third one, I'll follow your lead. You will get, again, about 80% of people who have been blowing you off will respond to an email like this. And they'll simply respond with, let me see if I can go forward. Yeah. So here's something. Um, would you say that I follow up? Kindly let me know a time frame. Blah, blah, blah. December would be great. And so this is March 14th, okay? So she, this is not on her radar screen to think about this right now. So if I follow up with her in a month and then in a month, it's not going to do any good. So you better believe I put this in my tickler file for nine months later and followed up with her. So giving people that permission. Um, okay, cool. Any other questions coming in or we're good? We got one, we got one from earlier. Um, do re about email email signatures, do reply follow-up emails need a full signature or can you um, shorten it? You can shorten it. Um, the only exception I have to that is, yeah, once you have a complete signature of your signature and you have a complete signature of their signature, you can just say Jerry or Sam or whatever. Um, you can be nice to someone. If you haven't responded in a while, uh, you certainly can put it in there. And the other ex strong exception to that is there are people who have those email programs where the signature goes way at the bottom. Like it's not just, let me see. You know, it's not just like, you know, somebody's writing and it has their email, their address or whatever, a uh, signature. And then somebody's writing and it has their signature. And then somebody's writing. It's where you put all this. And then at the bottom, like six pages down, you'd have, like, their signature six times. Do you know what I'm talking about, Katie? Yes, I do. Yeah. So if yours is like that, then try and cut and paste it so that the person can see, because then it could seem like you've never given me your address. So um, you don't need to put a full one every time. It actually can be annoying, um, but you don't want to be a jerk. Again, your, your point is to be um, as amenable as possible without being over the top. So once you have put your, your complete signature in there, you do not have to put it in again unless, you know, like I say, it, it's just... You, and again, if you're referencing someone, something, you could say, here's my signature again. Feel free to, to click on the website below for the information you requested or something like that. Okay? Um, two phrases that get people out of the maybe zone also. Uh, one is new news. I, I use the phrase news, so I'm not sure. I know uh, Katie was saying some things were cutting off on my, the bottom of my screen, and I do apologize for that. I attempted to correct that, and I was unsuccessful. So um, I'll send a phrase that says something like, I wasn't sure if no news meant no new news or no thank you. Can you see that, or that's completely cut off your screen? The last thing we see is no thank, so the next line's cut off. Oh, okay, so that's fine. So I wasn't sure if no news meant no new news or no thank you. And this person's reply, no news meant no new news. So that's great with just hearing back from someone. Like, you're in the abyss. Where are you? Do you exist? Are you alive? Get people out of the abyss zone with news is a phrase people like, and thumbs is a phrase people like. So here we have... I wanted to just touch base and say hello. Is the timing any better now for considering our product or for considering a meeting? Thumbs up, down, or middle? And um, so this is a great phrase. And people come back. Uh, and again, this person responded the following morning. Nothing to report at this time. Thanks for keeping in touch. So this will get somebody who's been ignoring you to uh, let you know they're still there. And I, I, I realized we're in our final five minutes, so I'm keeping an eye on the time. So news, any no new news or no thank you? 
and thumbs would be thumbs up, down, or middle. And again, you're at ending both with a question mark. Okay? And then, okay, this is a key one. Huge point, again, if you're kind of thinking about checking it out or exiting this call, I invite you to, to tune in for this particular slide. I invite you to um, never, and you notice I have not said that word yet in this call, use the word please in an email. Please is an awesome word uh, in person and on the phone, um, anything like that, but in an email, please comes across as kind of a, a command word, a parental word, a pedantic word, and you know, please get back to me by four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, or whatever it is. Um, please let me know if you're interested. I invite you to replace it with kindly. And this is a not a usual thing to do, but this has absolutely been proven that this works as far as getting an email reply. So I think, yeah. I, so instead of please replace with kindly. Okay, um, let me see. Um, I was asked to talk about if you're applying for a job in an email, and I have four points for this. The first is one page or less in the text, uh, the body of the email. The only attachment to the email should be your resume. Do not Include photos of yourself in the resume or email, and customize, customize, customize. Show you've read the job description and take the time to explain how your experience fits their exact criteria. So one page, one attachment, no photos, customize. Okay, yeah, use contractions. A lot of people think I will not be able to help you with this or I am happy to help you with that. We want to use contractions. So use contractions. Don't, can't, I'm, we're. Um, better people respond more favorably and positively to contractions than they do to un uncontracted forms. Let me see. Okay. The other thing is people love to hear back from you to let them know, um, like I was talking about earlier, I'm on the run, I'm racing to a meeting, more to follow, just a quick check-in from someone. Still working on this, stay tuned, as opposed to just ignoring someone. That's why I say yes, respond on your phone, respond to an email, let people know that you are connected. Okay, and let me see, I'm going to do that, okay, and I'll just say two other questions people also ask me, and then we'll go to the final slide, is people will ask in emails, should we click um, reply to the current email, or should we start a fresh email? Um, almost always click reply, you want to keep a long trail of emails. And another question people often ask me is, if their email includes a contact phone number in it, should we email them or call them? Um, my answer is generally email them. You want to use the form of contact that that person chose to have with you. Okay? And I think, yeah, so I'll just say our little, oh, I mean, my, my little thing is coming up here. Take 64 seconds to retrieve your train of thought after an interruption by an email. So that means if you check your inbox every five minutes, you waste 8.5 hours per week. So we definitely need to check our inbox, but maybe not every five minutes. So with that, I will put the final slide over to Katie. And um, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate. And I truly hope that you received useful materials today. Karen, we have a couple of questions that came in that I want to address. So um, a couple of people asked, are there any suggestions for replacing the word please other than kindly? For example, please let me know if there is anything else I can help you with. Kindly doesn't really seem to fit there, so um, I'll let you take over. Uh, n no, that's the best substitute, and kindly does work. Yeah, kindly let me know. Uh, yeah, whatever that sentence was you just said, kindly is perfect. 
if there's anything I can help you with. Okay, great. And then go oh, ahead. Oh, let me know if there's anything. Well, yeah, that's also, a, that's not a good phrase. You could just say, what else can I help you with? Where can I help you? What can I help you with? What, how can I, another phrase is, how can I help you feel uh, the most supported? You know, turn it into a question. That's, that's kind of a, yeah, that sentence in and of itself is, a, is kind of a fluff question, uh, excuse me, a fluff sentence. So I would either leave it out or turn it into a question. Because that's just one of those phrases like, I look forward to hearing from you. Like, okay, well, I don't look forward to writing you. So, yeah. I, I change the sentence altogether, but if you are going to use the sentence, I'd use it with kindly. Great. Okay, well, um, with, with that, we will wrap up. We're a little over. It's just after 4 o'clock here. So, Karen, thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, who took time out of your day to sit in with the Yang Time webinar. Um, I think it's safe to say we all learned a lot today. And a quick reminder, there's uh, information for our next webinar, March 12th, with um, our very own Taylor Mitchell at the Auto Care Association. We're so excited to have her. Um, and registration information will go out later this week on Thursday. So. Um, until next time, thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.